Thank you, Derek, and thank you again for uh, inviting me to this incredible course. I've really enjoyed it, learned a great deal. Now I can see why you all want to live in California, you know, sitting out there. Um, it's a beautiful place, and congratulations again. So the, um, uh, this keynote is actually, a, I'm going to give you a little bit of an update on paraparasitic joint infection. Probably you've heard about all of them, and the main conflict of interest is that I might mention one or two products from companies that I'm either working with or might have royalties or might have ownership. So infection is on the rise, and uh, that has become really one of the most important problems over the last decade or so. And as you can see from the interest in the literature in terms of people's academic activity, we are paying more and more attention to the subject of infection. And the number of publications, the number of uh, scholarly activities is uh, increasing. And the reason infection is important is one, because it leads to high morbidity, problems that unfortunately leads to loss of limb, multiple surgeries and need for hospital admissions, etc. And it also leads to increased mortality. And as I was saying yesterday, handing somebody a diagnosis of periprosthetic joint infection is equivalent to giving them a diagnosis of cancer. And in fact, the five-year mortality of periprosthetic joint infection is pretty similar to some of the common cancers that we have seen. And a recent study on the Medicare population that I did with Steve Kurtz shows a five-year survivorship following periprosthetic infection of the knee is 75%, breast cancer is 77%, and it's um, uh, slightly worse after uh, total hip replacement. So we must, of course, make every effort to try to prevent infection, and we went through this yesterday, the conceptual formula of uh, CDC, and I won't dwell on it too much, but honestly, we must pay attention to infection prevention because that's our best chance of changing the course of a disease for patients. And again, as I've said, infection is a bundle, starts at home, and then takes a, a course throughout the journey of the patient in the hospital. And there are some conditions we've come to recognize in recent years that are very, very important in terms of exposing our patients to infection. Some of these were well known. Some of these are now becoming more and more important. For example, anemia, very important disease, needs to be optimized. Affective disorders, psychological disorder, patients with severe psychological disorders such as depression or schizophrenia are a much higher risk of infection. The vitamin D deficiency, that's become um, uh, important as well. And if you're not familiar with, which I'm sure you all are, the subject of microbiome has become a fascinating topic over the last decade and is probably going to change the course of medicine altogether. Not just periprosthetic joint infection, but a course of medicine altogether. We basically live in a sea of microbes for every cell in our body, there is four to five microbes. And for the most part, these microbes live in the GI tract, the respiratory tract. But what we've come to recognize is there is microbiome, distinct microbiome to every single site in the body, the eye, brain, and joints. And for the most part, we live in harmony with these organisms. And in fact, they play a very important function in our body. And this symbiotic relationship usually prevents the development of a disease. But when the, the equilibrium is disturbed, state of dysbiosis arises. And conditions that have been linked to dysbiosis are getting higher and higher. This particular slide is all the conditions described in nature, science, PNAS, and cell over the past two years. And you can see there are some very interesting and important conditions that are related to dysbiosis. The mechanisms of Alzheimer's and the new drug that's in the clinical trial for prevention of Alzheimer's manipulates the microbiome of the body. And there will be more and more of microbiome manipulation strategies in the future for prevention, treatment, and progression of diseases. Shoulder has a distinct microbiome, mostly led by C. acne. For shoulder surgeons in the room, that should not be a surprise. But there is also a distinct microbiome in the hip, 
and the knee joint. And what's interesting is that this distinct microbiome changes depending on whether the patient has had an injection or surgical procedure. And there may be a possibility that the microbiome cannot recover itself in the given time, leading the patient to a higher risk for infection. For example, if you do a steroid injection into a knee joint, you will find that there is more and more of the serratia and ralistonia and staphorias in that knee than if the knee did not have an injection. And it took almost three to six months for that microbiome to recover itself to the baseline. So this would explain why some surgeons are hesitant to perform a joint replacement on a patient that's had a recent injection. Perhaps that is the science related to microbiome. This year in the Knee Society, we presented a paper which has, has, on, has been ongoing, and there are some more new data that I can share with you. But this was a study in which we did a surveillance of the microbiome in the knee joint of four sets of patients. Patients who had no arthritis undergoing surgical procedure for like meniscectomy, perhaps ACL. Patients who had knee arthritis undergoing total knee replacement. Patients who were undergoing revision for a definite aseptic reason. And patients undergoing surgery for periposthetic joint infection. The last group, we also aspirated their contralateral joint, which may or may not have had a prosthesis. What did we find? I think it's fascinating. First, every knee with osteoarthritis had a distinct microbiome, every knee. And the microbiome of a knee with osteoarthritis differed from the microbiome of a knee without osteoarthritis. Is it the microbiome that led to osteoarthritis, or is it the osteoarthritis that changed the microbiome? We don't know. That's something that requires further investigation. But what is really fascinating is that in the patients who were all infected, the contralateral of the knee joint had exact the same organism in 100% of the time. So is the organism arising from the patient's own flora or is the organism becoming pathogenic when the circumstances arise, et cetera. These are all, I think, very, very important findings that I think will change the way, in, in, uh, the way we look at infection in the future. Michael Otto is one of the great investigators who leads the uh, investigations at NIH. This is his first paper that was published in Nature that showed administration of a probiotic, a bacillus, which actually is very uh, common in like natural yogurt, for example, changed the microbiome of the gut in volunteers in Thailand. And how it changed was that it removed most of the pathogenic profile in the gut, in particular, Staph aureus, and if there was any MRSA, MRSA. And then they went into the mechanistic um, description of how this happened in a mouse model that they had developed. And of course, it's a nature paper that was uh, particularly fascinating. They then did a randomized prospective study, also published in Nature, that showed the administration of a probiotic decolonized the gut from Staph aureus of all patients. Now, interestingly, and when I spoke to him, this would have been a fascinating study if we could have taken samples of the knee before and after administration of probiotic and see if that would have made a difference. We couldn't do it in that particular study, but we're doing that study right now, taking samples from patients that will probably give us some um, very, interesting, uh, very interesting findings. The other thing that's really been gaining attention is so-called the leaky gut syndrome that has had some witchcraft and some uh, some non-scientific claims, but the science on this is also fascinating and very solid. And again, this is a nature paper that looks into the mechanism by which uh, organisms from the gut can find their way into the joint, such as the knee, and cause disruption to the extracellular metrics and destroy the articular cartilage. 
and the mechanism is beautifully highlighted here. Now, how does leaky gut happen? The leaky gut happens depending on what you eat and your genetic predisposition. And the classical example is the obesity rate in this country compared to the Asian countries, for example. All of us feel this has to do with the diet. It does, but it also has to do with the genetics. And that would explain why the incidence of arthritis is so different. In India, for every nine knee replacements, you will do one hip replacement. In Greece, for every nine hip replacements, you do one knee replacement. What is the difference? Why is the geographic difference or the genetic difference so, so pronounced in some of these countries? Then you might say, how does an organism from the gut make its way to the knee joint? Trojan horse theory, first described in nature. There's been three other papers published in science. What this is, is incredibly fascinating. The organisms are able to get into the inside the white blood cells, macrophages and neutrophils, and not only these white blood cells are not able to destroy them, they actually use these white blood cells as a mode of transport from one location to another, Trojan horse. And then when they get to that destination, they will uh, disembark and uh, become resident of that uh, particular site. So they can go to the heart, they can go to the brain, they can go to any site in the body. There is now some research showing that diabetes is as a result of Trojan horse, the, uh, Trojan horse mechanism when organisms from the gut attack the pancreas, islet cells, in patients who have predisposition and diabetes could potentially be preventable. Interesting theories. We've looked into this. We published on the dysbiosis and the epithelial integrity, how important it is. I won't go into the details, but there are markers for epithelial integrity in the gut. For example, CD34, zonulin, multiple other markers. We measured those in patients who had joint infection, who had arthritis, who also had no arthritis. And sure enough, the level of those markers were very different. And here, electromicroscopy, again from that Nature paper, showing how these organisms survive inside the white blood cell and travel from one site to another and then attack that site when they disembark from the white cells. This is a fantastic Harvard technology that will allow us, comes from the Wiss Institute, that will allow us to do a surveillance of the uh, gut or other sites in the body in real time and this will actually convey messages to the computer. Stefano, this is right up your alley. And it will give us incredibly important information that we could use potentially for manipulation of diseases. So does this have an implication for us in this room? Absolutely it does. The days of metal and plastic is numbered. It may not happen in my lifetime or perhaps yours, but there will come a point where we will not be replacing joints because we will be treating uh, arthritis and or preventing it by biological means. If you're skeptical of that statement, just see what happened to the rheumatoid arthritis and the story that goes with rheumatoid arthritis, how the disease-modifying agents have changed the course and the progression of that disease. So that will come. And if you're still a skeptical, look at the story of Barry Marshall and Robin Warren two gastroenterologists from Australia who first described an association between Campylobacter pylori, later to be named Helicobacter pylori, and gastritis. They were in San Francisco in 1984 giving a lecture about the subject. They were literally booed off the stage. They had to go back to Australia, and Robin Warren had to swallow Helicobacter pylori to show that the, the, that, that led to gastritis, almost to the point of near death. 24 years later, they get the Nobel Prize in medicine. And it was probably one of the initial descriptions of dysbiosis. And yes, there is a correlation between gut microbiome and osteoarthritis. Perhaps some of these geographic differences we see in the incidence of any diseases, but in particular, arthritis is related to microbiome. And by the way, the genetics that we have 
also determines the microbiome. This is another nature paper, fascinating, doesn't let me go into the details, but basically they're talking about intraluminal organisms evading through the epithelial integrity of the gut, traveling around the body, destroying the knee joint. Again, mechanistic description, and that has been very, very fascinating. So future is not going to be the same, it will change. And unless we adjust, we will see other people come and steal our lunch. Diagnosis. There is no absolute test for diagnosis of infection. There will never be an absolute test for diagnosis of parasitic joint infection. There are numerous examples of conditions like this in medicine where we don't have a single test to diagnose. Ankylosing spondylitis, psychiatric disorders, you know, all of these. So in the absence of an absolute test, you have to rely on diagnostic criteria. The 2018 diagnostic criteria that we, we introduced and has met with some uh, skepticism or some resistance was that we were doing this to try to push for biomarkers. It wasn't. It was to do for the, 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 uh, describing the role of each of these tests in a separate fashion. The MSIS criteria, which obviously I was part of when we developed, it gave the same diagnostic weight to ESR, neutrophil differential, and to other, so th there was the minor criteria all bunched together and major criteria. Well, there's a difference between ESR and neutrophil differential. They don't carry the same diagnostic odd ra odds ratio. That's why there are scores assigned to each one of these. And then, yes, yeah, sure, there is the synovial CRP and there's alpha defensin. But if you look here, if you have a synovial fluid that was sufficient for you to do a neutrophil differential and or cell count, you don't need alpha defensin. It'll be the same weight. So whether alpha defensin was positive or not, an elevated cell count is, is a score of three. So having an abnormal alpha defensin and an elevated cell count is not six, it is a still three. But if you have those tests, then you can put, uh, put them in the right context. And this is a little more sensitive because some of these infections are very subtle. In particular, infection with like C. acne, which we know about, slow-growing organisms like coagulative staph, and even some of these gram-negatives that are flying under the radar would have been missed by MSIS, whereas now they're being caught, at least 20% of them, by the new definition. So you don't have to, by the way, remember those numbers. There is the app, PGI-DX, that you can put those metrics and I'll tell you with some degree of certainty whether the patient does or does not have an infection. Biomarkers have definitely played an important role. We and others have been interested in this. C-reactive protein and synovial fluid was one of those first ones that we talked about. It is a still a very useful one. It has an AUC of 0 0.92, which is great. We've had interest in this uh, strip, which is the leukocyte esterase. And of course, Carl Dermagium published a paper on the use of alpha defensin um, for diagnosis of infection. But I will tell you, and this is a common email, so hopefully I'm saving myself some time. People say, um, do you need alpha defensin in every case? No, you don't. This is Jason Jennings' work that showed if you have enough fluid to do the analysis for cell count and neutrophil differential, alpha defensin doesn't play any role in that situation. This is work of Robin Patel from Mayo Clinic showing that uh, same thing. The PMM percentage and cell count are just as good as alpha defensin. And then, of course, there has been the introduction of this um, lateral flow test, which requires some processing and some work, and the initial results of this had uh, very, very low sensitivity. And then, please, don't do alpha defense in a reimplantation. I get these emails all the time. I did alpha defense in a reimplant case, came back positive. I have no idea what that means, because that study has never been done. We don't know if alpha defense or biomarkers have a role in determining optimal timing of reimplantation, Nick Bedard's work. But what I think is going to happen is we're going to move away from synovial markers into serum markers. We were interested and still interested in D-dimer. It's a great screening test. And people say, well, it's not very accurate for diagnosis. If C-reactive protein is positive, do you automatically assume the patient is infected? If the C-reactive protein is negative, do you automatically assume the patient is not infected? 
D-dimer is supposed to do the exact same thing. A positive D-dimer doesn't mean the patient is infected. A negative D-dimer doesn't rule it out. But it's a great screening test. And now with the new work that matched brother Sad Tarabici, who, by the way, will be applying for residency, he's done a fascinating work that shows if D-dimer is under 120, the likelihood of a patient being infected is zero. Great screening test. I'll do that in all of my aseptics and quite honestly put a huge weight on that one single test. If D-dimer is elevated, doesn't mean the patient is infected, of course. We will also move towards isolation of pathogens from the blood, not synovial fluid. And there are already some technologies. None of these I'm conflicted with. They have all great technologies for diagnosis of pneumonia, sepsis, encephalitis, endocarditis, etc. Great technologies which I think will change the way. And Alberto Carli from HSS, working with this particular company, they were able to isolate free-floating DNA of microbes in the blood, not the synovial fluid, in blood. So that will also change the way. And this is a fascinating uh, technology being developed again at MIT, microfluidics, which will actually allow us not only to diagnose infection, but also get an idea about the signal of a pathogen that exists. There is a major issue with culture negative infections. A lot of people say, well, I have no problem. I treat culture negative the same way as culture positive and the results are exactly the same. But first of all, that's a false statement. But number two, how do you treat culture negatives? What do you give them? Culture, uh, uh, gram positive coverage? Gram negative coverage? Do you cover fungi? What if it was a mycobacterium? And plus, this is 21st century. You can't have a patient undergoing two surgical procedures, six weeks of intravenous antimicrobial, and you don't even know what the organism is. Isn't the patient entitled to ask you, what are you going to put in the cement? What are you going to give me intravenously if you don't know what the organism is? Great question. And then, of course, administration of broad spectrum of antimicrobials not only is expensive, exposes your patients to undue risks. So it is unacceptable to have culture negative infections. And we must move towards better techniques. Culture is an old technique, 1886. In recent years, there's been interest in next year and sequencing. And a few years ago, I worked with a company that had great technology, still does. There are more companies that are coming out with molecular techniques for isolation of a pathogen, particularly when the, uh, when the cultures are negative. They will change the way in the future. There are some great studies already in other fields of medicine showing that if you treat a patient based on molecular signals, they have better outcome than if you treat them based on culture results. This is for urinary tract infection. I didn't know, but there's about 30 to 40% urinary, tracts, urinary tract infections in which you can isolate the organism. This is the follow-up of a study that just got published literally last week showing that if you treated the patient based on microbial sequencing, it had a better outcome. And by the way, it narrowed the antimicrobial treatment because a lot of people say with the molecular techniques, you isolate all these organisms and I have to do a lot more anti, uh, antimicrobials. Doesn't seem to be necessarily true. Encephalitis, meningitis, treated with based on signals from sequencing versus culture, better results. We've also published on this multi-center study, and I believe some of you in this room were part of this multi-center study, that basically showed if you treat these patients based on the signal from NGS, particularly culture negatives, they may have better outcome. Now, that randomized perspective study is ongoing, and that statement will have to be proven, but what Maj Tarabishi, that's sitting in the crowd here, published in his paper, was that you could isolate an organism in 80, 90 percent of culture negative cases. That's great, because it tells you what organism you're dealing with, and you can focus on dealing with that particular organism. Now, as we're coming to close, I want to share with you a couple of thoughts that I have had, which we will prove soon, and is, if it's not proven already. I believe infections are caused by multiple organisms, not one, multiple organisms. What happens is with culture, we only isolate the dominant organism and we miss the others. 
and then they come back later causing infection. What we call reinfection could be a persistence of infection. This is Bonnie Bassler, microbiologist from Princeton, which I'm sure will win the Nobel Prize at some point in the future. She has contributed immensely to the field of medicine by her work on microbial communities. She believes microbes exist in communities just like we do. They cross talk, they have molecular techniques, they are very sophisticated, quorum sensing, etc. We have signal from this multi-center study that if you ignore that, uh, the mi multiple microbes, they can come back and cause a later infection. On the 1,800 patients we have in that multi-center study, the patients had culture and NGS, both at the first and the second surgery. The patients who later failed had the same signal in the resection arthroplasty. On the treatment, our way of dealing with irrigation and debridement and dealing with acute infection with a failure rate in the 30s, 40, 50 percent is unacceptable, has to change. We have to do better. We know that uh, there is technique dependent. It, there may be a need for a repeat irrigation and debridement. We obviously need to do chemical and mechanical debridement, but we must do better. So Simon Young's work on intraosseous delivery of antibiotics, where the concentration will go beyond MIC, but beyond MBC, MBC or MBEC, much more important than just the concentration administered through uh, systemic means. One stage exchange is gaining popularity. We know that from endoclinic group, the results are great in a large group of patients. Informed trial from Britain and uh, Sweden just got published. Sure, small sim uh, sample series, but it showed there was no difference in outcome between single stage and, and, uh, and, and the two stage. And by the way, this was not cherry picked. This was all comers, regardless, some patients with sinuses. And of course, the results were better in terms of patient satisfaction and cost with the one stage exchange. We're moving toward shorter length of antibiotics. CDC wants us to administer only one dose of antibiotics and no more. We have done some work, Tim Tan, who was here, uh, published that retrospective series. There was no difference in the group of patients receiving one antibiotic versus three doses of antibiotics, outpatient versus inpatient, when they were matched together, multivariate analysis. The uh, American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons sponsoring a very important study being led by the Duke team, uh, Thorsten Saylor, Michael Bolognese, and Bill Geranek. And they have, I believe, almost 3,000 patients. They have to get to three, 6,000 to see whether there's a difference in infection rate when you give one antibiotic versus three doses of antibiotics. We may be moving away from the intravenous antibiotics. This is Matt Scarborough's work that was published in New England Journal of Medicine, Knee Society, Hip Society, MSIS, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, and American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons have given us a very generous grant to evaluate this in a large series of patients. We're up to 50 patients now. If any of you in this room has an interest in randomizing your patients to oral versus intravenous, please contact me. We must do this study. The basis for us given six weeks of intravenous antibiotics is so, so loose. There is no scientific rationale for giving intravenous antibiotics with everybody, and the six weeks may be an overtreatment. But alternative treatments are emerging, bioform disruptions. We're going to be moving towards the use of antimicrobial peptides. There is three clinical trials in orthopedics that I'm aware of currently that is using AMPs for treatment of infection. In particular, the results in the acute infection looks very, very promising. We're going to move towards the use of nature to fight nature. Lugdenin, for example, an enzyme from Lugdenensis can be used to eradicate biofilm. We will be altering the surface of implants, and in fact, we're doing so right now as we speak. This is nanotubules by a company in Australia that basically mimics the structure of the, uh, the wing and the insects. These nanotubules will prevent bacteria or microbes from attaching to the surface and hopefully translating to a lower rate of infection in the future. My great friend, Professor Suchia from Japan, has his um, technology of putting iodine or povidine iodine on the implant surfaces. The results in, in uh, Japan look very, very promising, and hopefully we'll see this technology in the U.S. at some point in the future. 
we will see new antibiotics, and again, we will see manipulation of microbiome, maybe probiotic and uh, prebiotic administration. And finally, phages are back. So there is three clinical trial right now. What is a phage? Phage is a, basically a virus that attaches itself to a microbe, like a bacterium, and destroys it. It was a 1915 discovery by British military. It went away as penicillin came in, and now we have found that this is fascinating. This is, by the way, how COVID works too. So the virus attaches itself to the membrane of the bacterium, injects the DNA into the cell, reassembles into the virus, produces enzymes called lysins, these orange bodies that you'll see in a second, they will destroy the cell wall and they will destroy the bacterium. I've used it on three patients. These are humanitarian use right now because FDA hasn't approved it. Particularly important in patients with multi-resistant organisms. Fantastic technology and I think it will definitely change the way we do things. Thank you very much and I'll stop here. Jay, thanks for an exceptional session, really updating everybody on the microbiome concept. Totally agree with you. So the assumption, therefore, is when we do a primary knee, we're doing a primary knee in an infected field, or at least at a, in a field with microbes that are there. So the idea that it was ever sterile is sort of like it's a matter of manipulating or managing the, um, the, the balance between the pathologic and non-pathologic making. So what can we do? And I think I know the answer, like to explain this, in the perioperative period to maintain that balance. Because obviously there are things we can probably do where there's uh, glucose control, maybe even managing diet um, before and after surgery to start to work on helping that, my, that, that existing biome. Yeah. But you know what I'm getting at. Absolutely. Uh, so prebiotics, for example, may be administered to these patients to try to manipulate their microbiome address the levels of zonulin, for example, the epithelial integrity has to be addressed. Part of the reason why hyperglycemia leads to infection has to do with the actual epithelial integrity. And it has to do with the fact that there is probably a larger bio, uh, bio burden that leads to infection in the first place. Yeah, so that will be done. I'll give you a classical example of how food and bacillus and all these are important. If you're ever worried about food poisoning, Eat two or three uh, uh, spoons of natural yogurt. It will completely destroy the new pathogen entering into your GI tract. So we give these patients six weeks of horrible, high doses, toxic antibiotics. And then we expect these patients to clear their infection and knee joint. Could it be that there is need for alternative treatments, adjuvant treatments, so I think the microbiome manipulation in a scientific fashion, and I'm not talking about walking into you know, some store and picking up anything off the shelf, will do. Like the treatment of chronic inflammatory bowel disease is done by FMCs, fecal matter transplants. And that has changed the way they've been looking at inflammatory bowel disease. Some fascinating papers published in highly scientific journals. So that will change. We will be preventing osteoarthritis in the years to come. Thank you. So I have two questions. One about the treatment, so more clinical. How long IV treatment should be, what you're thinking, like as of today? Let's say I want to change my practice for a musculoskeletal infection. Should we give any IV antibiotics? If you should give, how long? Is it two weeks, three? Yeah, so that comes, that six weeks come from the 1989 literature of septic arthritis and osteomyelitis in pediatric patient population when the group of kids received two weeks, four weeks, and six weeks. And the, pa and the young children that received six weeks of intravenous antibiotic had a less complicated course with the septic arthritis and the osteomyelitis. Hence, it was assumed that any orthopedic infection would require a minimum of six weeks of intravenous antibiotic. So when the first series of PJI and two-stage exchange were published by Dr. Insull, they were using six weeks of intravenous antibiotic. And we have just taken that as the word of gospel, carried on since that day, never looked back to see the origin 
of the six weeks. So that's the course, the treatment, the duration, based on no science or minimal science, irrelevant science. Septic arthritis in a kid is very different than chronic parapocytic joint infection in an adult. Intravenous versus oral. Well, kids, you couldn't give them oral. They had to be on intravenous with septic arthritis, particularly acute infection. Again, has been made, you know, we have assumed that intravenous is absolutely necessary. So Matt Scarborough's work that was published in Europe, they randomized these patients to intravenous versus oral. There was no difference in terms of outcome. So I think the study that we're doing right now will definitely answer two questions. One is, do you always need intravenous? The answer is going to be probably no. And then two is, who in that case can receive oral and not need intravenous. Now, oral antibiotics with bioavailability is not there for all organisms. There will be some infections that we may have to treat with intravenously. But to say I have to do six weeks intravenously all the time is not based on science, and I think that study will definitely give us the answer. Now, the duration, we're not studying it right now because that would have been too many variables, but I think the future could probably we should be doing a study with the shorter duration of treatment versus the six weeks. I will tell you what will change, though. If we did get that serum marker for infection, and I don't know whether it's CRP, whether it's fibrinogen, whether it's some interleukin, you could monitor these patients and then potentially stop the treatment when the marker has dropped below whatever the threshold is. They do that in oncology all the time. Why don't we do that in treatment? So we will most likely have that biomarker, which will give us some idea as to whether a patient needs six weeks or four weeks. And maybe there are some patients that need more than six weeks. But these are great questions that, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for. But I do think with further scientific and academic activity, we should be able to answer those questions. OK, my second question about the NGS. Yeah. So. Is there any worry that they will be over-diagnosing? Because whenever we have an implant in the body, we know that whatever the number you want to use, 20, 30 percent of the time, there's some colonization if you culture all of them, yeah. although they don't have any clinical symptoms at all if you are removing that hardware for any other reason. So if are we going to be over-diagnosing every little this colonization or latent colonizations, then we'll be treating and going after? Yeah, and also microbiome, great question. So I just told you that every knee has a microbiome and that DNA signal is gonna be picked up by NGS. So what do you do in that situation? So I, my answer to you is really twofold. Right now, I do use NGS for all infected cases. The cases that I know that are infected, the ESR is high, CRP is high, cell count is up, et cetera. You know they're infected. And whatever signal comes on that NGS, I will assume they're all pathogens. I don't want to take a risk and assume they are contaminants or they're part of the microbiome. The second thing is you cannot act on the result of a single test alone. You don't act on the result of an elevated cell count and do a two-stage exchange. You don't act on the result of culture and do a two-stage exchange. And just should be treated the same. So if you have a situation where you know clinically the patient is not infected, and NGS is picking up signal, that's most likely, to your point, colonization or part of the microbiome. So if I have a patient undergoing revision, ESR was normal, cell count was normal, neutrophil differential was normal, the fluid looked good, leukocyte esterase was negative, and then NGS picks up five organisms, doesn't matter. That's not infected. I'm not going to treat it. But if I have a very, if I have an infected case, and NGS picks up three organisms, based on the data that I see now, I will treat, I will treat all three organisms. I hope that answers the question. But by definition, an organism that's not part of the microbiome or a symbiotic relationship will be producing some enzymes or other things to destroy or damage the host. That's what the definition of pathogen is. So in the future, I think if they can pick up other signals together with the isolation of the organism, like, for example, proteases, enzymes that are interlinked, we will be able to be a little bit more clever in terms of who gets treatment, who doesn't. But thank you for that great question.
I don't have a question, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for coming to our meeting and just uh, a round of applause for Dr. Parvizi.